Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're going to get started. Um, I'm Holly Saad. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the director of school counseling here at Waterford High School. Um, I just started just about a month ago, and I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, thanks for coming this evening. Obviously, this is a very important topic and one that is stressful for all of us as we plan for our future, especially post-secondary planning with our students. Um, so I will pass it over to the expert in the field, Char Charles Wareham from Valar Financial. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Hi, guys. Hi. Thanks for coming out. I know uh, we were in the auditorium last year, I think, and some people went that way, some went this way. So welcome. I'm glad you found it. My name is Charles. I run Valark Financial Services. We're located in downtown Hartford. And for more than 30 years, myself and my team have been providing these presentations at high schools uh, literally all around Connecticut. For more than 30 years, myself and my team, we've helped literally thousands of Connecticut families figure out how to make college affordable, doable, and realistic. And I've been asked to come here tonight to share with you some of the experiences and the things that we've seen along the way it's to help you become more successful with your own college plans as well. A couple of housekeeping things before we get started. The slides are not in the workbook but the workbook does more or less follow the presentation, except it will go a bit deeper if you'd like. There is a comment card here, and if you'd like to request any level of follow-up, I do find a lot of people, uh, you know, a lot of information going to be delivered tonight, and if you want follow-up specific to your situation, just let me know how to find you with your contact information, and if you'd like to go direct to my calendar to talk offline, we have our little UPC scanny thing there. Just scan that, it goes direct to my calendar, and I'll be happy happy to chat with you. There's no cost or obligation for the presentation or the materials. This is not a profit center for us. This is a way to meet new folks and to help some families be successful, make new friends, and if I can make new friends, I'd be happy to. Uh, I want to share with you also a little bit of background uh, or more info about our office. Uh, our website is valark.com. I would encourage you to jot it down, but it's also on the materials, and in large part because right on the cover of our website, we have a banner that scrolls across with the most recent up-to-date information, including market updates. I'm not going to get into it more than 15 seconds on this, but as you can probably see, the world is on fire. And we're very concerned about investments for our clients, and if you'd like to talk about that, we can talk about that with you also. We also have a YouTube channel, and a lot of the material that we cover in this presentation is covered in little sections on our YouTube channel. I would encourage you to subscribe and load there. We also do a lot of market update there if you'd like to find out what's going on in the world and what our thoughts are on, on where we should be investing and so forth. That's a really great place to get that information. I'd like to share with you just a bit about myself. I'm just like you. I got one of them there, youngsters. <laughs> This is my son, Logan. This is when he was a freshman. He's now a senior, senior at Penn State. Unbelievably proud of him, as I'm sure you are of your stu students also. So I can talk about this topic not only from the perspective of a financial advisor, but also as a perspective of a parent. And I can tell you the two are completely different. For 28, 29 years, I was just helping families just like yourselves. When I get into it for my own self, I find lots of interesting things that I didn't know about. And I'm going to share with you some of those tidbits as we go. By the way, uh, how many parents of seniors in the room? Most of us. Okay, juniors. Any underclassmen? All right, a handful. That's good news. So I'm going to kind of prep you a little bit for the experience that you'll have. And one of the first experiences you'll have is, just like I was, eventually you'll be sitting in a room like this, where there's some guy up here talking about how wonderful it is to attend that university and convincing you to spend your dollars at their school. And over and over again, the story is more or less the same. You do the campus walk around. They tell you about their curriculum. And eventually, we get to this slide in just about every single presentation. And in this slide, they say, we meet some level of financial aid for your family. And X number of our students receive a scholarship. And I look at this and I say, what the heck does that mean? And not only that, I'm pretty sure that these folks here are, are really nice people and they know their campus well, but do they know anything about financial aid or let alone your particular family situation? 
So my job as a financial advisor specializing in this stuff is to take that massive amount of information that is out there and boil it down into a boots on the ground strategy that you can use in your families when you get home tonight. My goal is to help you that when you get to the kitchen table and you are talking to your kids about what's doable, realistic and affordable, you are coming from a reality based place. There's so many myths and misinformation about how college really gets paid for, including that there is tons of financial aid out there. In fact, I sometimes have to uh, coach our hosts and counselors at the school, don't call this financial aid night. Let's call it how to pay for college night because we're gonna find out there may not be as much accessibility to financial aid as you imagine. We're certainly gonna cover that, but more I'm gonna talk about the, real, the reality base, the real story, the truth of how college gets paid for. And I'm gonna do it in five sections. We think there's five partners out there, and these five partners are the folks that have to work together in order to make this happen. So we're gonna talk about what they can do, but also what they can't do so again, when you get to the kitchen table, you have a reality-based understanding of what is really going on out there. And of course, the first of those partners is the government, and they make available for us that FAFSA form. Stands for Free Application for Student Aid, and you can find it at fafsa.gov, and when you get there, you'll see a screen that looks something like this. This is generally handled in October of the senior year. Same time that you are filling out the Common App and doing all the essays and other things, very likely you'll be working on the FAFSA and that is the entry point for all things financial in terms of paying for college, except for this year. This year the form is delayed till roughly December 10th. We'll talk a little bit more about that. I don't think it changes the game too much, but just to be aware there is that slight change. If you are new, you'll start here. Both the student and the parent will complete parts of the FAFSA and have separate login IDs. Fun fact, the FAFSA system thinks your student is doing the FAFSA. <laughs> right. So they actually have to give you, the parent, access to their FAFSA in order for you to do your part. So we suggest that either parents, you take control of this process, get your you know, youngster's credentials, create a profile for them, then piggyback on top of that, or make sure your student understands that they're the first one in this process. So we're going to talk a lot tonight that this is a transition for the youngsters from being a youngster to being a financially responsible adult, and this is usually the first stop on that train. So FAFSA, completed generally speaking in October, except the year, year the form is gonna be a little bit late. You'll wanna create a username and password for both yourself and for the student. And eventually, you'll be talking about the value of your farm, your assets, your accounts, your household, and so on. One thing that in the past, is that you had to put in your income. You would like physically type it in. These days, it directly pulls from the IRS. So this is important because the information they're gonna use is your last most recently filed tax return. And for some people, that might be an issue because last year was either better than or worse than this year. And how do we handle that discrepancy? I'll talk about that in a moment. We handle it in the negotiation process. This is not extremely challenging though. I have colleagues out there who will do these sorts of presentations and all night long, they go line by line by line on the stupid FAFSA. And to me, I think that's a monumental waste of time because this thing is not that challenging. If you can do a tax return, if you can fill out a work application, you're probably going to be okay. I'd rather talk with you tonight about strategy rather than filling out forms. Hopefully that's okay. But if you do get stuck, there is this thing called FAFSA Day. And FAFSA Day, uh, it's a little different since the COVID era. Uh, so now I don't know exactly where they all are, but if you type into Google FAFSA Day for Connecticut, you will find various dates and locations around the state where fo folks like myself or Holly or tax advisors, people who know these things, 
will set up shop in the library or the media center and they will help you. You bring in your stuff and they'll help you to complete the form and get things kind of squared away. But probably this is not going to be too challenging. I wouldn't sweat too much about completing the FAFSA. There's nine sections to the FAFSA, six of which really don't matter. These six ones here are more demographical in nature. It's the last three that actually influence the outcome of the FAFSA. So let's go through some of these things. Up at the top here, an independent student versus dependent. What that really means is, will we be required to include the parental assets? And you might remember in days past when you and I went to school, it was possible to live off a of campus, have your own apartment, your own electric bill. Eventually, you were declared independent. In those days, they called it emancipated. And now they would stop looking at the parental assets and income. And because that student is a poor, starving student, suddenly they qualify for lots of financial aid. Unfortunately, the system doesn't work like that any longer. It's incredibly difficult to be declared independent you would have to meet one of 13 possible criteria, and those criteria are, are difficult. It's student is married, uh, has kids, a veteran of the armed services, graduate student over age 24, um, an orphan, a ward of the court. Most likely, the vast majority of the students that you know associated with the parents in this room will be considered dependent, and that means that we will have to include the parental assets and income. Who is the parent? That would seem obvious. But more they're talking about who's the custodian, and this shows up in a divorce scenario. Now, the situation has changed a little bit recently. It used to be that they would say, where do the kids live the most? And that would be the person that completes the FAFSA. And the other person, whoever that may be, is not considered at all. They might as well be Daddy Warbucks because it won't show up and affect the scenario. Well, recently, as we'll find in a second, there were some changes to the FAFSA that they now say it's the parent that provides the most support. Well, how do we define that? Is it the person who pays the alimony? Is it the person who drives them back and forth to soccer camp? Is it who puts the roof over their head? And it got really, really murky. So they've gone back to the original definition to say where do the kids live the most? And if we can control that, for instance, if we have two parents in the same school district, one has more income and assets than the other, maybe we would select carefully who fills out the form. We'll go into that in a bit. Eventually, we get to household assets and income. Income comes off the tax return. Nothing we can do about it. It's going to flow through. It's just going to happen. Assets, however, I am asked all the time. I have savings. I have investments. Is this going to count against me? Do I need a shovel and a coffee can and dig a hole in the backyard, put my money in, you know, bury it in the ground? And the answer is maybe. We'll go into it. <laughs> but it looks kind of like this. All the time I'm asked, what counts, what doesn't count? The answer is this. Anything that is owned jointly or individually by you or your spouse is expected to be used to help pay for school. Now, I put some examples up there, common stuff, stocks, bonds, mutual funds, cash in the bank, uh, CDs, savings accounts. Uh, here's a fun one, investment real estate. If you have a timeshare, a condo, a second home, if you're part owner on your parents' house because she gifted it to you and your brother to get it out of her estate, that might count. If you're joint owner on your parents' um, savings or investment account, again, because they want it out of their estate or they want to have control of it, again, that could show up. So it doesn't matter so much what the investment or the asset is. It could be a jet airplane, a house, or a fishing rod. What matters is who owns it. And if it's owned individually by you or in jointly with your spouse or someone else, it's expected to be used towards your ability to pay for school. On the other side here, all the stuff that's not considered. Retirement accounts, IRAs, 401ks, TSAs, cash value of life insurance, annuities, home equity is not considered. Some small business assets are not considered. Yes, ma'am. How are trusts handled? Are they looking at the trustees or the beneficiaries? Every trust is individual, so it's difficult for me to answer that question, but see me after and I'll be happy to tell you. It depends on how the trust is written. 
But thank you. That's a good point. But you, you know, that's the idea is it doesn't matter, you know, what's in the trust or in the account. What matters is who owns it. Anything that you can get your hands on, generally speaking, is expected to be used to pay for school. So, you know, we look at this and say, gosh, do I need to, that shovel and that, you know, go like this? The answer is probably not. There are some cases where we should. There are even advisors out there, guys like myself, licensed advisors who should know this stuff, who will say, take all of your money off of this side of the page, put it into an annuity, and suddenly you get tons of financial aid. Not true. Please don't do it. And now to get the money out of the annuity, you have all kinds of taxes and penalties and big problem. We'll, we'll deal with that more in a moment. So what happens next? You fill out the form. Oh, yes, sir. Quick question. Yeah. You said, uh, for instance, like uh, my mother's elderly. I'm like on her account. Right. Thing, and I'm just on just to help her pay bills. Yeah, yeah, her. yeah. How soon should I get off of that so I don't have to talk about So it? the answer is soon. <laughs> <laughs> but the bigger answer is, will it make a difference? And as we're going to find out in a moment, it's really assets that's not the biggest problem. When we, you know, as we go through, you'll see in a moment that I don't think that's going to be something to count against you unless other things apply. And is there, is there like a, you know, seven years or, you know, is there like a look back to the FAFSA? No, it's immediate. When you sign the FAFSA, you are signing a statement of your financial condition at that exact moment your pen touches paper. You could win the Powerball yesterday, go down to Mohegan, blow it all, come back and say you have no money, and it's true. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what happens next? First thing is you're going to get something called a student aid report, and that's just um, a summary of all of the inputs that you put into the FAFSA. And if we get back a FAFSA or a financial aid award that's substantially different than we thought it would be, that's the first place we're going to look to see if you put line six on line seven, or you have an extra zero somewhere. Uh, student aid report will help us to understand that. It also shows us your preliminary expected family contribution, EFC. We're gonna hear this term a lot tonight. They've changed it more to call it a student aid index, but I think EFC makes more sense because it stands for expected family contribution. And the whole premise of the financial aid system is that as parents, we are expected to contribute to our kids' education to the extent that we can. And that extent we can part is being measured by our friends that run the FAFSA. We might think as we fill out the FAFSA, we're inviting the government to tell us how much stuff we qualify for. Other way around. We are in, uh, asking the government to measure our ability to pay. And I promise you, you will disagree <laughs> with what they say your ability to pay is. So part of my job tonight is to temper you for this shock and surprise, but also to show you the way through. You'll see your preliminary EFC on the student aid report, and I'm going to try and give this to you in advance tonight so you can be prepared for it. Anyway, um, each school is going to send their award letter out in the springtime. February, March, in, you know, in that time period is a busy time for us because we're helping clients understand their award letters. You'll see offers from the school to say, congratulations, you're accepted. And here's the financial support that we can offer you. We think at that point we're not done. That now we go into the negotiation and appeal process, and I'll talk with you a little bit about how that works too. Some quick items about changes. Um, I did mention the divorce thing, and it was changed to whichever parent provides the most support, but then it was clarified to say wherever they live the most, which is basically how it's always been. If there's a 50-50 like, a to the second split of where people live, you know, it goes to another level to say who provides support, but usually that's more than sufficient. Here's another change that was made that really bothers me. And I don't have the answer for you on this yet, and it hasn't been resolved yet. It used to be that if you had more than one student in school at the same time, they would divide your ability to pay by the number of students in school. They've taken that away. It's now your ability to pay is per student, which with such an egregious change, we think it's an oversight. We think it's a mistake. And in fact, the change has been pushed back. It was supposed to happen in 22-23, it's now 24-25, which I know some of you will experience, but we still have not received clarification on what the heck that means. 
We have lobbyists in Washington right now trying to get an answer on this, and when they tell me, I'll tell you. But until then, we, we're not sure whether this is for real or for not. So one thing I would encourage you is on your little comment card there, if you want to, Add your email address at the bottom. That puts you on our email list. You can unsubscribe at any time, but as we get updates, we'll pass them on to you. So the FAFSA, relatively easy. You can do it in an hour, hour and a half, make a cup of tea, save it, come back to it, nibble at it, it'll be fine. It's only 36 some questions, no big deal. But wait, there's more. There's a second form out there. It's called the CSS Profile. The CSS profile is 18 pages of hair-pulling, mind-numbing financial data gathering. We call it a three-glass-of-winer. <laughs> and the reason is, is because it is designed to capture all the information that the FAFSA leaves out. And it's used at schools that we consider to be what we call a mini-elites. And many elite just means they are more expensive than or think they are more prestigious than a Yukon. So this is going to be Rochester, Syracuse, Rhode Island School of Design, Marist, uh, St. Joe's, Boston College. I mean, all the schools our kids are considering, right? So very likely many of you will encounter the profile. And when you get there, you will find it requires much more detail. Thank goodness we only have to do it once, but there is a fee for submission, so consider that also. It already asks for information about the non-custodial parent in a divorce scenario, and it already asks about retirement accounts and home equities. Years ago, this presentation used to be all about how do we hide money from financial aid officers. Most of that stuff has been closed down. And so now we talk about strategy, but the, the, the profile led the way by shutting down retirement accounts, home equity. The idea is if you have $6 million in your 401k and not a penny saved for college, that's not gonna be a favorable scenario when it comes to a mini elite school that uses the profile. I'll get you through it, but I just wanna make you aware of that. So when we talk about the assets, the CSS profile already asks about everything. So when you're developing the list of schools for your students, you're also going to want to check which forms they are asking about. If you want, send an email to my office with the list of schools your student is considering. I'll send you back a list of what information they're looking for. And that might help you decide what strategy we're using, whether it's a FAFSA school or a profile school. All right, let's do a little bit of math. I want you to understand how financial aid is calculated and delivered. Yes, ma'am. Is that one or the other? No, it's either, they either want the FAFSA or they want both. New York State has a third form. They want all three. So, yeah, they're, they're digging into, the, the idea is, you know, these mini elite schools have big endowments. They have money to give. They want to make sure it's going to a family that actually needs it rather than a family that has taken action to hide and shelter monies. So let's do the math so you can understand how this all works. It's pretty simple math, whatever the cost of attendance is. Subtract from that, that family ability to pay or expected contribution, and the result is your financial need. And financial need is that amount that theoretically you qualify for in some sort of a financial aid package. So let's put some money on uh, numbers on it. Let's take a $20,000 cost of attendance, you know, mid-level state school. We do the forms, we find out the ability to pay is 5,000 a year. Ah, simple, 15,000 financial need, I get it. That makes perfect sense. In fact, it makes so much sense that we also intuitively understand that if the cost of attendance goes up, our EFC doesn't change. That's based on a current snapshot of our financial health, our assets and income, right? Shouldn't change from school to school. So we would imagine that we would see more support for a more expensive school. There's two problems here. Problem number one is something we call gapping. Gapping says there just is not enough financial support out there to fill these huge costs and, and needs that we are seeing. Cost of school is rising, rising, rising. Aid is being cut, cut, cut. 
And so at an expensive school, you may find that you're required to pay more than your expected family contribution simply because there's not enough support to fill that gap. And when we understand that, we start making much better choices in terms of school cost. The second part that's a little bit challenging here is that 5,000. I put that up there for a reason. And that's when we go to talk to families and say, tell me about your family. Where do your kids want to go to school? And oh, by the way, how much have you budgeted to pay for college? Invariably, the answer is 5,000. I don't know why. Doesn't matter how much they make, what they, you know, 5,000 a year seems to be where it is. That's where people's comfort level is. Okay. Well, the feds might have an entirely different number in mind for you. Thumbnail financial planning says that for an income of $100,000 in a family, no assets, just income alone, 100,000 will generate 20,000 of ability to pay. So in your little booklet here, uh, let's see, it's on page, Eight, there is a little grid that on the top there going across, or on the side, excuse me, left hand side is household income. Going across the top on the right is assets on hand. And you just scan those two across and it will give you a thumbnail estimate of what the system says your ability to pay is. Is this per year? This is per year. <laughs> per kid? Per kid. Yes, as we understand the per kid thing to be based on, you know, our question mark in Washington right now. Twins. Right. So, a university, 125000 a year. You know, UConn, or excuse me, a UConn, 30000 cost of attendance. An average family, just a little over six figures, no assets at all, will have an ability to pay of over $28,000. And so now the financial need is 1200 essentially no need. And we're expected to cover those dollars. And, and I know, I, I, I see the, the color coming out of people's faces. <laughs> I know. The problem is there's no cost of living adjustment. You know, if you lived in Walnut Bottom, Tennessee with an income of 125, you might have discretionary dollars. But here in Connecticut, here, you know, in this city, this is an affluent community. If, uh, we need that kind of income just to breathe the air, let alone pay the taxes. So I get it. Unfortunately, the system says it is what it is, and if we add a little bit of additional assets on top, you can see the ability to pay went up, but not by very much. So my message here is it's not the assets that's the problem. We don't need a coffee can and a shovel. Our problem is income. And as soon as we understand that the income that we need to live and breathe the air in Connecticut probably takes us out of range for most of what we would normally consider financial aid, which is why I say, let's not call this financial aid night. Let's call this how to pay for college night. I will show you how to pay for college. Here's a little more on that. Parents' assets and kids' assets, they want 5.6% of anything you have in individually or jointly owned accounts. They want 20% of anything that has the kid's name on it. That's, by the way, the number one thing we can clean up. If we have kids' names on things, give me a shout. I'll show you what to do. They don't allow you to have any dollar that is exempt. We used to have 17000 that you could have without them considering it. That's been taken away. By the way, have you seen the national debt? So <laughs> that's kind of what's going on here. And so we look at this and we say we need that shovel and that coffee can, but we never get to the next part to say that income is really the biggest problem. As much as 25% of your income, as much as half of what the kids have. By the way, kids working is not a big deal. They do get to protect some income. We want them working. We want them saving for their own college. The problem for kids' income is not working. It's capital gains. We have a stock or a bond or a mutual fund that has their name on it. It's done well, right? The market's been up for a while. And we sell it to pay for college. That gain is income in the kid's name, and they want half. So the timing of when we take action to prepare for college is, is also important. So guys, if there's one thing that, I, that, that I'd love for you to take home from this presentation tonight, please let it be this. And that is, it's not the assets. We think that saving money for college is a bad thing. It's not. We need it. Our problem is income. And as soon as we understand that our income, just to have the lifestyle we've chosen, will generate a certain outcome that prohibits most of what we would think is financial aid, 
we start making better choices in terms of school cost. Yes, ma'am. What about like 403Bs and chats that have the, the student's name on them? Uh, a 403B wouldn't accept as a beneficiary, I would think. And is that a problem? It's not a problem. Beneficiaries don't count, ownership does. Uh, a chat does, a chat, no, excuse me, a chat is owned by parents. It has the kids as the beneficiary, so it's considered a parental asset, not a kid's asset. Our biggest offender for the kids' assets is custodial accounts, UGMA and UTMA accounts, and sometimes we see joint ownership on checking or savings, but mostly these days we're seeing 529s, and 529s are a parental asset. Okay, so um, the income part is so important, we've developed a concept we call the income hot zone, and it helps us to understand the outcomes in certain income ranges. And if your income is between zero and 60,000, there's nothing for us to do. We're gonna qualify for every level of federal financial aid there is to qualify for. As soon as we start getting up to 60 and 120, there's phase outs. And now we might be able to wiggle around a little bit to get some improvement, but most of it, you know, as we get above 120, again, there's nothing for us to do. We don't need to reposition money. We don't need to hide stuff. The hole is already as deep it is, as it is going to get. And in that scenario, we qualify for $5,500 on the Stafford loan, a little bit of work study from Uncle Sam. That's it. That's a known. I've seen it a thousand times. So when we plan on that and we say, that's what I'm going to get from Uncle Sam, now again, it starts to drive our decision making in terms of college. So financial aid, by the way, I mean, it's a terrible word to describe what we get. What we actually get is a loan package. And now we have to understand we're paying for the total cost of school just over time and with interest, which leads us to the second player. Yes, sir. Um, on the income real quick, is that a household income? <laughs> household income, AGI. Bottom line, first page of the 1040, the adjusted gross income. Gross, so it's also gross. Add back to it any contributions you made to IRAs or 401k plans. They view retirement contributions as discretionary. You could choose not to contribute to your retirement in favor of paying for college. And for some folks, that's a strategy. For most of us, we have way more in our retirement plans than we have saved for college. So maybe we can beat up on retirement a little bit. We'll fix it later on so we can get the kids off the couch and into the pipeline. Do they, do they look in the, I know in the, the second one, not the FAFSA, but the- Profile. Profile, they ask about your return. They ask okay. about the balances, yes. What you got now. Okay. That's exactly right. Yep. So parents, you know, I'm one of those. We got a role in this. And tell me I'm wrong here. Tell me the kids don't have an expectation of a certain kind of college experience. We see it on Twitter, on TikTok, on MTV, and they're talking in the hallways saying, I want that. I want the ivy growing up the side of the building. And then they go to talk to the sales force, I mean recruiters. <laughs> that come to visit them, and the recruiters say things like, would you like a single suite dorm? <laughs> would you like the internship overseas or the nice, you know, internship in Boston? And yeah, these are great experiences, and believe me, I get it. We all want an experience that is at least equivalent to or better than the one that we had. Some of us were first time generation our kids are going to school, I get it. We want them to have a great college experience. Besides, they've done everything we've asked them to do. They went to band, they went to sports, they kept their nose clean, they got up early in the morning, they got great grades, they did the SAT prep, right? But then we look at some of the costs of this stuff, and I mean, my numbers need to be updated here. There's now schools in America that cost more than $90,000 a year, and I think our kids want to go to all of them. And even, you know, dear to my heart, Penn State, it started out at about 46 when my sons first went, and now 52, you know, UConn, over 30,000. We're thinking that Eastern is the new UConn. And frankly, Eastern's done a great job. Their campus is beautiful. They have dorms there. It's the true college experience. It's just not first pick in our youngsters' minds. But our youngsters have no idea what this really means in terms of paying for school. I got an email once from one of my clients. Looks just like this. And this was when UConn was less than 30. And he says, you know, I got a bunch of support here. I'm not sure what this all means, but what I see at the end here is amount due by parents, 2,800. I mean, that's good, right? 
that's, that's half the 5,000 I thought I would spend. It doesn't mean it's good. And then we look at it more closely and yes, it's just the ability to borrow. And that's why I say financial aid these days is more or less a loan package. And when we understand that, again, we make better choices. Our kids are getting into an epidemic of lending. And as parents, I believe it's part of our job to help them understand that. They say the national average is $26,000 of debt per student, and that's true. But it includes the folks that are going to Tunxis or Manchester versus the ones who are going to Wesleyan. That's not this community. This is an affluent a community that values education. We're thinking UConn at minimum or better. So our probably costs and our debt is more like my friend here with 72. And I know, I know, I, I've heard it all before. I know what the kids will say. Mom, Dad, it's okay. I'll borrow a little bit more, but I'm going to get a great job when I graduate and I'll pay it off really quick. It's going to be awesome. Kids don't know what $72,000 of debt means. They don't know that's a condo mortgage without the condo. So when you talk to them about the debt, don't talk about the balance. Doesn't correlate. They don't get it. Talk about the loan payment. They understand that. So we have a very simple formula that we use that say take whatever the amount of debt you expect to graduate with, divide it by 100, that's your loan payment. So my friend over there who had $72,000 worth of debt when he graduates, he'll have 720 a month of loan payment when he graduates. So we say things like, you're smart. You got accepted to great schools. Be smart one more time and make a value-based choice for school, not a brand-based one. Think about not what just happens year one through four. Think about what happens year five and on. And I know very close and dear friends who are living in their parents' basement because they have six figures of college debt and can't get out of it. So I'd encourage you to have that debt-based conversation with them, and hopefully that will get us closer to better choices. In the end, uh, there is the loan cancellation thing from Biden. And, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen here. It gets revised every other time. This is now the fifth iteration of the Biden loan forgiveness plan. And so I'm not even going to go into the details. There is a big summary in your book here, but I honestly don't think it's going to last. Have you seen the national debt? And so I think that when the next administration comes along, there's going to be a lot of changes. And even if this thing stayed in place, they say that, yes, we will forgive $20,000 worth of debt in the 20th year. But what they don't tell you is for every additional $1,000 of debt you have at that time, adds another year to wait for forgiveness. So my friend there was 72,000, let's say he pays it down to $50,000 of debt. And he's, you know, 20 years out, he's, he's not going to get loan forgiveness until he's dead. We don't think that this is a viable way to pay for college, and I think it does more damage to our nation than it helps our students. That's a whole different topic, but I would encourage you to not consider it as a way out. Which leads us to the students. Students have a role in this. And as I had mentioned before, this is the transition from youngster to adulthood. And it's going to, you know, the train's pulling into the station and we'll be leaving soon. We suggest that the youngsters need to be participating in and finding these sources of funding. They should be participating in filling out the applications, getting ahead of the curve with scholarships. You know, if you have a senior now, we should be well engaged into the process of filling out applications for school. And still I'm talking with people, they don't know what school they're going to, they haven't even started yet. So let's, let's get the you know, kids involved with that if we can. Let's understand that students are the primary borrowers. It's their loan, they're, they're gonna be paying it. The parents are the co-signer, but we wanna help them make smart choices in terms of school costs and not get too far over the skis with debt. Here's a fun one. Remember the interest payments on the loan are often due right away. There is only one true student deferred loan and it is the Stafford subsidized loan, sometimes called the direct subsidized loan. The max we can get on that program is $3,500 in the first year. That's the max. Everything else beyond that has interest start accumulating right away. There's no more deferral till after you graduate. So let's help our youngsters understand that too. I'm often asked, you know, can my kids do stuff to find scholarships? And yeah, they can. We used to recommend a whole laundry list of websites, and there's probably still some out there, but we've simplified it now, and we recommend the Scully app. 
And this is a Shark Tank product. Any Shark Tank fans? Mm. Are, awesome, I love that show. <laughs> anyway, the Sharks got a hold of it, turned it into a more uh, bigger operation. I think they charge a buck you know, to get the thing. But once you do it, you input your students' information, it goes out into the interweb and searches for scholarships and things that are a match and gives you an easy to use interface to track and apply for them. I think it's a great option. I think everyone who's a stakeholder in that youngster's education should have Scully installed on their phone and have it point to that youngster. So now when you're sitting in the dentist's office, instead of playing Yahtzee, you know, fiddle around with Scully instead and see if we can generate some support for them also. In the end, there is federal financial aid out there. Yes, ma'am. So are you suggesting that, like, a grandparent? Yes. How? They put Scully on their phone, yeah. if they're, you know, phone friendly, and uh, the student's name is your student, and it points to them. They have a, you know, student ID number on Scully, so to speak, and any scholarships that they drum up and generate for them point to that student. Not based on the grandparent's. Information. No, not on their financials. No, no, no. It's on the achievements of the students. So in the end, we have to process stuff. We have to send an essay. You have to qualify. Let's let them do some of that legwork. So in the end, there is federal financial aid that is out there. There is still the Pell Grant and the FSCOG. There is still money at the state level. But the qualifications for this stuff are so severe, most of us are not going to see it. Unless our income is 60, 75 or less, we're not going to see what we would normally consider financial aid from Uncle Sam. So I need to retrain your thinking to not think about the government as the source of funding, but instead to think of where it really comes from, which is career specific and merit and achievement dollars. I have colleagues who do these kinds of presentations and all night long they talk about the Pell Grant and no one in the room is going to qualify for it. So let's talk about the real money. It comes from either career specific and the best example here is ROTC. Reserve Officer Training Corps that if you're willing to serve in the nation's military for a short period of time, they will pay for you to go to school. Maybe that's not for everyone, but it might be for some. Even National Guards, you can serve part-time and they will pay for in-state tuition at UConn. Most of us will probably find some sort of grant dollars available in our career of choice. Health and Human Services, Police and Firefighters, I've seen grant money for architects. So Google up for what dollars might be available in your student's field of study, and you might find some grant dollars available there. But by far, the biggest source of dollars is the merit and achievement dollars. That's scholarships, leadership awards, money that comes from the actual university themselves. They all have ability to grant some dollars, some more than others, and depending on your student's achievements, we can see a lot of support there. We say things to the youngsters like, this is your time. By all means, shoot for the stars, select the schools that you want to go to, but we need to have the achievements and the grades and the performance that brings in the scholarship and merit dollars to bring the cost of that school to be down to be competitive with our other possible options. This is grades-based, always has been. And I'm always asked, well, what grades? And I say the conversation starts at about a 3.5 GPA. At about that level, we start to qualify for the presidential scholarship, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars a year, perhaps. We get three, six, three, seven. It starts going twelve, fourteen, sixteen thousand dollars a scholarship. Three, eight, three, nine, four, zero. Oh, we start seeing big monies coming in from the endowments. Largest award in the history of our office was sixty-seven thousand dollars of scholarship in one particular year. Of course, it was an absolute home run. The student was off the charts in every measuring criteria. But it's more, you know, we see it all the time, $33,000, $35,000 a year for a good level student with achievement in the community. I think that's the way we bring Boston College down to be competitive with UConn, which now leads us to one of the other players in the process, and that is the students. Yes, sir? Do you have to apply for that, or you just put your... Like it's, well, it goes along with your application. So you're sending in the FAFSA, the profile, your common app, your essays, and everything else, and the school will look at it and say, wow, phenomenal student. We'd like to make you a financial offer. That's more or less how it goes. Yes, ma'am. Is there, do you have to fill out the FAFSA? Is there a con to 
there, n there's no con that I know of. You know, I've, I hear people say, my gosh, I, have, I make too much money. Why do I even bother? And I say the fastest way not to get financial aid is not to apply. If we do the FAFSA, you're guaranteed to get the Stafford loan. Every citizen does. Uh, some schools won't consider the application complete without the FAFSA. And we certainly won't qualify for the endowment dollars if we don't submit a profile. So the school's job in this is, you know, as I mentioned to the gentleman, to, to make you an offer. And so this is actual data from Rochester, a couple of years old, but still valid. And it suggests here at the time Rochester was about 50,000, and they provided a whole bunch of support for a top level student to bring the cost down to less than half uh, based on her achievements. And I said, wow, that's fantastic. Look, we got 20 grand plus of grants and scholarship, free money. We got the Stafford subsidized loan. That's the one we don't pay the interest back. Uncle Sam does. Good deal, right? But, you know, we said, gosh, let's send the same offer to UConn, see what they have to say. UConn said, wow, you're a great student. We love it. We'd like to do the Academic Excellence Award for you. Or we'd like to give your parents the privilege of borrowing 15500 at 7.9%. No work study, no subsidized money, all unsubsidized money. And, you know, I look at this and I say, I get this. I understand, you know, UConn doesn't have the same kind of money that Rochester does, but they cost less too, so maybe it's okay. What I don't get is this part. A federal program where no money was offered at one school, but a different school on the same program offered dollars. What's the difference? You know, we would think that a federal program would be consistent from school to school, and in fact it's not, because the schools push this money down to the school level to distribute how they see fit based on whom they want to attract. And when I saw that, I said, aha, I got you, now I know we can negotiate. So we think that when the financial aid awards come back, when the letters come back giving you an offer, we're not done. Now we go into the negotiation and appeal phase. We take the 12 schools that you've applied to, that become the six that you get an offer from, that become the three to four that you really like, become the one to two that we negotiate that becomes the one you select. We think there's four appealable points. Point number one, unmet need. Remember a bunch of slides ago, we talked about gapping? There was mathematical need there that was not filled by the system. That's the single biggest thing that we can appeal on. We can ask for more support. We can say, you know, we have a need here. Is there anything more that we can do? Number two, unrecognized achievement. What can we bring forward about this student that is special and unique, that would show that school what an awesome student they would be getting if they could just provide that little extra support? Things like Eagle Scout, captain of the baseball team, first chair trumpet, sports and leadership, debate team, volunteer in the community. Let's save all of the certificates and awards that they got when they were youngsters because when they become a senior, we're gonna compile a pro forma out of those things and use it to shop your student. Just like if you were a baseball recruiter and you were shopping a left-handed pitcher, how would you do it? You'd have an eight by 10 glossy, you'd have all their stats, you'd have all kinds of their achievements. Same concept, we're gonna be an agent for your student, you are. Number three, uh, difficulty within the family. What financial challenges might have occurred? COVID is still out there. It's an ending story, it's a pain in the rear, but we can still talk about it. We can say things like, it was challenging, we burned through our savings, my job hours were cut back. Whatever the story is, we can bring that one forward. If there was a healthcare crisis, you know, anything financial that caused some difficulty in the family. Number four, competition between schools. And this is where we pit one school literally against the other. And we will say to school A, gosh, we love you guys, you're awesome. We'd love to go to your school but School B offered a little bit more support. If you could kindly match their offer, we'd be happy to accept your invitation to attend. We literally send letters from Rochester to UConn to show them what their other offers were and say, UConn makes sense, we love it here, we'd love to attend. And in this case, we said, we know you can't match this because you don't have those big endowments, but you didn't give us money on a federal program that Rochester did. If you would kindly match what Rochester did on those federal programs, we consider coming to UConn. They did. We still went to Rochester. <laughs> 
But the point is you, you can have this negotiating story here. Don't call them. They'll blow you off. Besides, it's only interns that answer the phone in the financial aid office anyways. They don't even know how to do it. Uh, don't fill out the form that says, please explain your unique circumstances. When we get that form, we write in the box, see attached. What we want is a narrative, a page, two pages long, handwritten by you and your student that talks about your story along those four criteria. Send it FedEx, make them sign for it. Stand out in the crowd. I'll tell you more about this a little bit later on, but just for brevity's sake, yeah, we want to stand out. We want to uh, send it FedEx, make them sign, hard copy, handwritten letter, and we've seen results from this over and over again. These are uh, emails I received from our friends that say, look, you know, Quinnipiac stepped up and offered some additional dollars. I'm not sure if it's an all-time record for Quinnipiac, but it's still pretty good, and we see this all the time. It's not just a one-off. We find that about half of the time that we have a negotiation or appeal that we get some sort of a positive outcome, and I would encourage you to do that too. Don't pay someone to do it. As soon as they find out there's a paid professional involved, conversation changes. Make it a heartfelt communication from you by mail, sent FedEx, followed up with some sort of a phone call or visit. Yeah, COVID-19 is still a negotiation strategy. It is fading into the background. Some of the rules that made money available under COVID for college are now closed down. Um, I wanna point out one thing if you choose to talk about COVID. Before you do, please visit our YouTube channel and find a video called How to Maximize the College Application Process. We did a podcast with Dr. Carolyn Sorkin and she's the former admissions director at Brown University. She now runs a consulting service to help students position themselves in the best possible light. And we had a whole thing on COVID. And the long story short is, yes, COVID was terrible. You can talk about it, but don't end the story there. Don't say it was awful and that's it. Say it was terrible, but here's what we did about it. You can say the robotics club was closed down. My son couldn't go to robotics. He couldn't build a robot. It's terrible. So we built a particle accelerator in his basement instead. <laughs> Let's make it a positive outcome to show not only how we survived, but how we thrived. And I think that will serve you well. Last part, you know, the last player in the process is the financial firms. And there's different kinds. There's some that provide investments in lending and research. And I wanna talk about two in particular that we really find are helpful. And I'm asked all the time, where should I put my college funds? And the no-brainer answer for a state of Connecticut resident is the Chet 529 plan. Because it is the only plan on the face of the planet that will give a Connecticut resident a $10,000 a year deduction on their taxes for deposits made. And yet, when I go to see people at their homes and talk about the programs they have, over and over again, I'm seeing non-CHET plans. We had one recently, it was the Alaska plan. So I had to ask, did, did you ever live in Alaska? Do you plan to live in, you know, why do we have this plan? And over and over again, the answer most often is, my advisor said CHET was terrible. Garbage. For compliance reasons, I can't discuss with you who runs the CHET plan, but you can look it up if you like. And when you do, I think you'll find that the investment selection and their performance is more than satisfactory. And if you're having problems with your 529 performance, it might not be the 529's fault. It's possible. The portfolio you have that's invested in, you know those age-based portfolios? And we have to think about it for a moment. Those age-based portfolios, they're the default option. And many folks don't take it any further than that. They take the default and that's it. We think if we do this right, we're going to have big money going through the chat plans and we should manage it just as well. So think about this. If you have the age-based plan today with a 16, 17, 18-year-old, you have a bond-based portfolio. They shift to bonds as the kids get older, which theoretically is more conservative. Problem is, when interest rates go up, what happens to bonds? They go down. And we've had some of the sharpest interest rate increases in recently ever. So you might be in a portfolio that might be more exposed to downside pressure because of the interest rate rises. 
Many research reports are out there that will illustrate this concept that you can investigate yourself. 2022 was the year's worst year in human history for bonds. And if you don't have the guidance you need on how to manage your portfolios during these types of events, well, you might want to consider working with a professional who can help. We think Chet is the best possible option because of the tax deductions. We think it has everything we need to be successful. Chesla is another one of my favorites. Chesla is the state of Connecticut's lending agency. They make money available for Connecticut residents at a reasonable rate to help our youngsters go to, to the school of their choice. The rate is pretty good, 6.35, not too bad, you know, fixed as well, that's great. Uh, but what I really like is this co-borrower release feature. And this says if the kids pay their bills on time when they graduate and they keep their credit up, you can be carved off as a co-signer on this loan. Now makes it 100% theirs. That's important if you have more than one youngster because we want to free up the capacity to borrow for the youngsters that might come along behind that. We think Chesla is a great option. Another option is Citizens Bank. They're doing a pretty good job in the education market these days also. All right, last section. Uh, we'll do like five minutes here and then we'll stop and take some questions. Uh, I, I know that this can be a challenging presentation and I see you know, kind of color coming out of people's faces sometimes, but I have to tell you the truth of things so that we can get to the solution. And the solution that we use is something called stacking. Stacking says there is no one single solution here. There's lots of little solutions that as we pile them on top of each other, it starts to look more and more like a way to save for college. And sometimes the first part of the stacking solution is a realization that we might be a little short if you're feeling a little bit uncomfortable right now, that just means you're normal. It's functionally impossible to save enough to pay for college in one shot. College gets paid for with some cash flow, some lending, some scholarships, some tax credits, and sometimes the first thing we need to do is to build into our budget a college expense as best as we can, work up to it, so that later on when the kids go to school, we redirect that money that we're used to saving to the university on part of their monthly payment plan. And then we augment it with distributions from your savings accounts. And sometimes, yeah, we say, let's get a little bit creative here. Maybe we can reduce retirement contributions fund the college with that. Maybe if we're paying more on the mortgage or credit cards than we need to, you know, maybe we can change that. Maybe now is not the time to redo the kitchen. But if we can develop cash flow, we can use that to help pay for school on the monthly payment plan. Most people will get a Stafford loan. Pretty much every American does. Some people might talk to Chesla to fill in the gaps. Some people might have Scully or other similar scholarships or merit and achievement awards. We didn't talk about it, but there's a whole way to transition a Roth into a Chet 529 plan. Roths are great for college funding because we don't pay a penalty. The penalty is waived if it's used for college, and the taxes apply only to the gains, not the principal. So it's a mild penalty to use a Roth. There is some state-sponsored assistance. Some people might qualify for work-study or tax credits. I love getting the family involved grandparents, nephews, other folks that might be stakeholders. Let's teach them to understand what the issue is. We had a wonderful 95-year-old grandmother who saved $50 religiously into her granddaughter's chat account because that's what she thought college cost. So we might have to educate some folks as we go. And then we might want to get creative. This is one of my favorites using cash value to help pay for college. Remember when the insurance agent came around and said, let's save for college inside the cash value of a life insurance plan. It's a great way to save for college. It won't show up for financial aid. It'll be awesome. Well, they were half right. It's a terrible way to save for college. But we're here now, so maybe we surrender the cash value, pay a little bit in taxes, take the money, deposit it into a 529 plan, get a tax deduction on the deposit. Then we go back and replace that life insurance policy, the expense of whole life with inexpensive term, take the savings on that, put that into Chet too. Most of us, we've got stuff everywhere. 
And if we can kind of organize and coordinate, we find often big wins that we stack up that can help us get there. In fact, I think this whole stacking thing is so important, we've developed a model in our office called an education cash flow model. And it looks like this. It's an Excel spreadsheet where we plug in the resources we have, the cost of the students, what loans and scholarships we think we're going to see based on history. The students might put in a little bit of work. We end up with amount due by parents. Then we start adding in the different cash flows, stock options, deposits, grandparents' money, inheritances, whatever it is that we might get. Do it for three kids, because we're going to process however many kids it is out the door, and pull out, you get a 30,000 foot view, and now we've got a model on how we're going to make this whole thing work. And now, if you go back here and you say, well, little Johnny over here is not going to spend 40 for a year, he's going to spend 75, but he gets a better scholarship, Boop, we plug it in and broop, it flows on through, and now we have a gizmo that can help us understand whether we are way out of line or whether we are in striking distance of making it possible. We do these for free all day long. Again, this is not a profit center. I want to help your kids be successful. I would like to make friends. We can help you to run these models. So what did we learn? Well, let's keep the expectations under control. The kids are driving this. Let's try and take that conversation back. Let's add some parenting in it and help them to understand what is really involved here. We see things like, you are not allowed to fall in love with a school until I tell you that you are. <laughs> because over and over again, we see kids falling in love with a certain outcome, and then we might have to pull their dreams back because it's financially out of reach, and we don't want the crying daughter scenario if we can help it. So we'll help to get there. Don't shoot yourself in the foot. Let's understand there's a lot of moving parts involved here. I'll help you to understand how that might apply to your individual situation. Let's use other people's money. That's lending, that's scholarships, that's family stakeholders. I know I beat up on loans a lot. I just don't want you to get too far over the skis with it because it's the easy choice. It's the sugar high. Let's try and find perhaps a better way. Negotiate, kick, scream, and appeal your awards. Don't call them, don't email them, they will blow you off. Write a letter outlining those four points. In the booklet, I think on the last couple of pages is more detail about negotiating and appealing, uh, page 28. And I'll help you get through that too if you like. Think stacking. There's no one single solution, it's lots of little solutions that we pile up on top of each other and still, until it starts to look like a way to pay for school. And finally, the trick is cash flow management. I mean, there's all these inputs. There's loans, there's cash flow, there's savings, there's grandparents. Let's organize it all on a spreadsheet. If you're an Excel whiz, I know you know just what to do, but you can do the same thing I did on the back of a Wendy's placemat. Let's just map it out, and then we'll start to get a better idea of how we're doing. And finally, grab some help if you need it. You know, Holly's office here is phenomenal. They have resources that, you know, all the people that have gone before you, the scholarships, the metrics of where they went, what they paid, the scholarships, great stuff. I'll put my contact information up as well. I'm happy to help. If you'd like to chat offline, I'd be more than happy to do it. You can scan your little UPC code there. It goes straight to my calendar. Plug yourself in. Or if you'd like individual attention, let me know how to find you with the comment card, and we'll reach out in a day or two and find a good time to chat. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Can I take any questions while we're here as a group? Yes, sir. So um, the 529s that a grandparent started. Yes. How does that into it? it doesn't show up at all. Okay. It's the last remaining financial aid shelter on the planet. But will it make a net difference? Because remember, it's your personal household income that drives anything. And if your income is north of that hot zone, everything else is irrelevant. Now we need those family assets and other things to help pay for that cost. But you're on the right track. It doesn't show up. Actually, there's one question on the profile. It's a little vague. It says, is there any money anywhere owned by anyone? <laughs> for the benefit of this student. <laughs> How you choose to answer that's up to you. They'll never find it. But you can, so but that money you just end up paying out of. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it, it is. I think it's great that grandparents have done that. Um, I might advise them to make sure they have the right state plan for the right deductions and it's invested right. Beyond that, they're doing all the right things. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, sir, in the orange. Do, do, do you redo the FAFSA? 
FAFSA every year or when your situation changes? Yes, the FAFSA is done every single year. Now, if your situation changes, you don't necessarily redo the FAFSA. You contact the financial aid office and let them know there's a change, but only if it's in your benefit. You know, you got laid off, income is cut. Yeah, I might call them and renegotiate. Yes, ma'am. That was kind of my question too about being on my mom's accounts. So I have a junior and a senior, so I was going to do the FAFSA, and he's going to go to three rooms. Okay. My daughter wants to go away to college, so that's, I don't know, where should I take my, mom, my name off my mom's account? Maybe. You know, again, it comes back to the first question. Will there be a benefit for doing so? And that might be driven by other factors like income and the rest of your family story. There might be a very good reason to have your name on it. You know, obviously, uh, moms and you know, our older parents do that for a good reason. Let's find out. Let's look at the story first and see if it makes a difference to make the change or not. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, it is. Um, you know, it's difficult for me to give individual advice in a group format, but things to watch out for is if you change it, if you sell it, where does it go? Is that legit? And second, what taxes would be involved to do so? If you want, we can chat a bit and I'll help you through that. Yes, sir. How or, or when do like a tuition reward program like SAGE come into play? Uh, I'm not familiar with that one. I do know about state prepaid tuition pans. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, not exactly sure. It's, it's called SAGE, but like a lot of schools all over the country are part of the program and you can get like almost like, you know. I might be learning something new right now. Let's chat after. and I'd love to learn about that. Sure. Okay. Any others? Uh, yes. Yeah, they might. I've seen this before. Um, it's hard to say in each individual scenario. It often depends on the school themselves. It depends on if they find out where the money came from. But I have seen stuff where a school will offer a scholarship and then, I don't know, the Kiwanis Club puts the money in, the school pulls back. I've seen that before. If it's possible that your employer could pay the money into your CHED account or to you personally rather than direct to the school, that would be good. Not sure if they will because they get some tax benefits by paying to the school. Yeah. Uh, one more if we need. Yes, sir. Uh, CS profile. We keep getting the email reminding us to complete the CS, CS profile. So, but we just we are reluctant to do it. Y you choose not to? A lot of information. Is it? Yes, it's very invasive. <laughs> <laughs> you could cho choose not to. Uh, but I would also talk with the school to see if they require it to receive scholarships. Again, the purpose of the profile is to determine if you are a worthy candidate to receive support. Uh, so, it, it, I, 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 well, it's for merit and scholarship dollars. So this, whether the school will choose to give you additional support for achievement, they want to make sure you're not hiding $8 million somewhere. That's what the profile is designed to do. Tell you what, I'm going to wrap up, but thank you so much. I will stick around after. We can talk individually offline. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.